predicted to have incomes similar to those that we have here. So we have 50% more people, and all of those people have more money, which means they want more animal protein. So in total, according to the FAO, we'll actually have a 100% increase in food production needs by the year 2050. So again, according to FAO, to do that, 20% of that additional food can, can come from new farmland, land that we don't farm at present. And about 10% can come from better cropping intensity, higher yield, just from the intensity of the crop. But about 70% is going to have to come from technology, existing ones, older ones, new ones, things that we put in place to improve productivity of all systems, whether it's crop, dairy, beef, sheep, swine, whatever. I began a long time ago with horses. I did my undergrad in animal science, my PhD was actually sheep. Then I moved here and moved into dairy and moved into beef. So most of the work I'm going to tell you about is based in dairy, but there's also some beef stuff in here as well. But in a way, it doesn't matter what sector you're involved in, whether it's animal, whether it's crop, whether it's forestry, this is an issue that isn't going to go away. Whether you be cosmopolitan or Newsweek or horse dairy, even global warming, climate change is on the front of almost everywhere. And we even have books. So, for example, here's the cover of the dairy herd management from August last year. And again, we're talking about energy efficiency. How is the dairy industry, can we become more energy efficient? But as a industry where we still have a relatively small proportion of our cows in non-conventional systems, we still have the larger conventional capos or big farms being demonized. And this is an advertisement from Organic Valley, which came out last year. Um, in a way, I like it because it's so clever, you know, it's pesticides, hormones and drugs, oh my, you know, it's so clever. But at the same time, that does demonize conventional act. And I personally think, as I say, there's a place for all of us to play, whether we're organic, whether we're local, whether we're big, whether we're small, intensive, or extra. So let me take you back. We talked earlier about um, agriculture in the past, and we put a paper out last year showing the US dairy industry in 1944 compared to 2007. So back then, we had a average milk yield per cow of about 4,800 pounds per year, and now up to over 20,000 pounds per year. But the graph on the right is absolutely true, and this is the, the type of data that we're faced with as a dairy industry, in that between 1944 and 2007, the carbon footprint of the cow, the amount of carbon that we can ascribe to the cow herself, the waste, the feeding operations, the fertilizers, everything in there, has actually doubled. So per cow, we have a far greater environmental impact than back then, back in 1944. But as a dairy industry, while we have cows, we're not necessarily in the business of making cows, as it were. We're in the business to make milk, to make ice cream, butter, yogurt, and cheese. So if we look at it on that basis, since 1944, as a whole US industry, we've made fabulous progress. Because the carbon footprint per gallon of milk has actually come down by two thirds. So in terms of environmental impact being more green, we've done some really, really fabulous things in the last 65 or so years. So on the right here, we have per gallon. At the bottom, we have the whole industry. And the whole US dairy industry has cut its total carbon footprint, its total environmental impact by 41% over the last 65 years. And that's a number that, as an industry, we should really, really be proud of, because we've done some really, really awesome stuff here. And if, the, and if that was a thing that's been done by the car industry or the housing um, building industry, they would be shouting about it. And as a dairy industry, we really have to 
talk about it because we've done some really 